Hello, friends. Welcome to Science Talk. I am your host, Jim Massa. Well, I want to discuss with you what you see right here. Heat wave, thought Siberia's tundra, it's on fire now. I'm sure you've all been seeing what's going on uh, in Siberia with the massive, persistent, long-term, ongoing heat wave that's been taking place uh, over Siberia for uh, several months. Temperatures much, much higher than average there. And of course, you know, we saw a 100 degree barrier breached and broken recently, but that wasn't really just a, a one-off. The temperature has been consistently very high. And of course, that leads to the permafrost thawing, which then leads to more greenhouse gases being released, such as methane, which sets up a positive feedback loop. So let's get into this. And first of all, here's a picture of fires. So you can see we got some uh, some, some trees here. It looks like we've got uh, low-lying vegetation here, some, uh, some ponds, and, there, and there's fires, and that's the smoke. And it looks like, as you look on the background, it's probably a bit of a river in the background there as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is central Yakutia, which is one of the coldest regions of Russia. 83% uh, of the land mass is covered by forests. And scientists are surprised how far this year's summer fires are burning. Okay, as I said at the outset, months, Siberia has been experiencing extreme heat due to a combo of persistent sunny weather and then as well as what we are doing to the planet. So the heat has, in addition to making very hot conditions, it's fueled enormous fire uh, outbreak of fires, fires on the tundra, which we find the permafrost underneath it all, which usually is supposed to stay cold and and uh, frozen. It's not the case. And as as the air above it gets hotter and hotter, the ground is going to dry out, making it more susceptible to uh, catching fire. So <clears throat> let's, uh, we've got orange dots shows location of fires detected in the week prior to July 6, 2020. This article was came out on this date, July 6. There you go, look at that. As you can see, it is widespread. Now, those dots are fires, not just high temp. This is with burning. Look how much of the place is burning. And there's a Verkoyants. Verkoyants is the town that reached 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 38 C. I mean, look at that. And the size of the dots indicates how widespread the fires are. As you can see, you know, that was a smallish fire, but we have some very large dots here and clusterings. And even all the way down the Kamchatka Peninsula, which is right here. This is widespread. This is not just an isolated location. And we all know how large a, man, a land mass uh, Russia uh, covers. Rash of fires on landscapes that are typically too cold, wet, and icy to burn is raising alarms for ecologists, climatologists, who, you know, rightfully so, take it as another indication that the Arctic is undergoing rapid changes that could tip off a cascade of consequences, both local and global. If fire becomes a regular occurrence on Siberia's thawing tundra, it could dramatically reshape entire ecosystems, causing new species to take over and perhaps priming the land for more fires. The fires themselves could exacerbate global warming by burning deep into the soil releasing carbon, usually in the form of methane, that has accumulated in frozen organic matter over hundreds of years, try millennia, many millennia. And also there's another issue, which is nitrous oxide, another greenhouse gas that is being released in large quantities from the thawing permafrost. 
Now, according to Dr. Thomas Smith, who's an environmental geographer for the London School of Economics, who's been following this, he said, this is not yet a massive contribution to climate change, but it's certainly a sign something different is happening. I think he might be underestimating that a bit when you see, you know, go back, let's go back up here and look at all these dots. That is a huge area. That is a, lot, a, a large amount of carbon being put back into the atmosphere. It will be significant. That's my assessment. So here's a, uh, you know, all the smoke here. Let's, this is uh, a view of the Siberia's uh, tundra fires from space. All this grayish. That's that's white. That's that's not that. That's like uh, you know, ice patches, whatever. But all this here, you can you can see it looks like the wind is blowing to the southwest. This direction of the plumes. But this is all fires. All this is fires. Now, keep in mind, fires do happen in, within the Arctic, just not so extensive. And we get them here in Alaska. Uh, it's part of what happened. But it's like everything else, it's, it's the uh, amount, it's how extensive it is, it's how much, is, uh, how much of the area is influenced and affected, etc. And how uh, ongoing, how long these events take place for. So, so far, 2020 has been a banner year for fire in the Russian Arctic. I mean, there's been a, a lot of it. So, Marka Parrington, who's a senior scientist with the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast, says that the fires started to spread across Siberia around the middle of June. Daily levels of fire radiative power, which is a measure of the fire's heat output, rival those seen in 2019, which is yet another extreme fire year. So we're seeing not just, oh, this is a one event. We're just seeing this happen repeatedly. And of course, this you know, exceeds anything else the Arctic has experienced since at least 2003. Russia's forestry agency estimates that millions of acres of land have burned in eastern Siberia, Sakha Republic, Chukotka, and Magadan regions. In addition to flames being extremely intense and widespread, scientists are struck by how far north the fires are burning and the type of ecosystems that are igniting. So in addition to a large number of fires uh, burning the northern boreal forests, many are bur burning even further north on the tundra. So the low-lying uh, vegetation is also going up and that tundra sits over carbon reach uh, carbon-rich peatlands. I do know how to talk, seriously. In all cases, the ecosystems that are burning sit atop frozen soil that comprise the permafrost, and this is where major concern, obviously, uh, takes place. Now, tundra fires are not unprecedented, but the science have documented a handful of large ones on Alaska's north slope in recent history. It's unusual to see so many at once over such a large area. That's the key. So many at once over such a large area. Several of the fires might even be getting, setting into geographic records. In late June, the European Space Agency Sentinel-2 satellite detected a series of fires at latitude close to 73 degrees north. The northernmost fires and records going back to 2003, according to satellite remote sensing expert Anna Maria Luongo. The most recent one spotted by Sentinel-2 on June 30 flared up just a few miles from the shores of the Laptev Sea, which is right off the coast of Siberia, obviously in the Arctic Ocean, obviously. I was a little shocked to see a fire burning 10 kilometers south of the bay of the Laptev Sea, which is uh, you know, basically the sea ice factory of the world, says Jessica McCarthy, who is a fire researcher at Miami University in Ohio. He goes, when I went to fire science as an undergraduate student, if someone had told me I'd be studying fire regimes in Greenland and the Arctic, I would have laughed at them. Well, it's no laughing matter anymore. 
Oh, here's the underlying cause of these fires. Since December, temperatures across Siberia have been way above normal due to a persistent ridge of high pressure air packed over the area that has produced warm, sunny weather, melting the snow packed early. The heat has backed off slightly since mid-June when the Siberian town of Verkhoyansk experienced a record-breaking 100-degree day, but it's far from gone. Same day, a fire was spotted on the shores of the Latev Sea. Air temperatures in the area reached 94 degrees Fahrenheit. To me, what's really shocking is how warm it's been relative to average for so many weeks and months, said Zach Leib, a climate scientist at Colorado State University. Uh, Zach Leib, is, uh, he's a recent, uh, uh, he recently defended his PhD. He was, uh, at, I think, UCAL Irvine. And now he's at Colorado State University. He's been tracking sea ice for quite some time, uh, noting the progress in terms of uh, the extent, the volume, the onset of melt, the onset of freezing, uh, et cetera. So he's been doing a lot of work of tracking uh, sea ice and looking at the meteorological uh, uh, situations up in the Arctic. He's been doing a lot of excellent work on this stuff here. Um, we, we follow each other on Twitter. So, um, yeah. yeah. So he's been uh, following a, bitch, a bunch of this. He's always tweeting out uh, the latest diagrams he's, uh, he puts together. So, uh, you can see here, here's a town. They got a bunch of, looks like the birch trees here. You got some, this looks like a little dwelling here. That's a dwelling. And to give you the idea of the size of the dwelling, there's a vehicle for scale. This is typical in the uh, with in the Arctic. You don't see very large houses. You see basically, you know, a very simple structure. I'm guessing, given the steep uh, the steep uh, pitch of the roof, is for sn uh, snow shedding. Probably a sleeping loft up in there. Yeah, this is very typical. And this is a community in South Siberia, blackened by a fire. Now you can see some of the ground is a little darker color here. And uh, can't really tell by, well, I'm seeing looks, I think that looks like leaves on the top. So I don't think the trees are necessarily affected, but you can definitely see some scorching on uh, the open ground. So, uh, all this is on top of the long-term climate change-driven warming trend, which is causing the Arctic to heat up more than twice the globally average rate. S recent uh, studies are indicating three times the global average rate. McCarty says the hot, dry weather likely dried out tons of vegetation, priming it to burn. Layers of partly decomposed organic material on the ground called duff have been warming and drying too. And if they dry out, it makes it vulnerable to catching fire. Smith suspects that the recent heat has also caused some additional thawing and drying deeper down into the permafrost, which contains a seasonally thawing layer, uh, active layer anyway. <clears throat> so when you look at the, at the, uh, at the uh, permafrost, there is a layer right below uh, the vegetation that's called the seasonal thaw active layer. That will thaw, and then usually some water nutrients that the tundra plants can absorb through their roots and can you know, continue doing that thing. Well, and then underneath that, you hit the ground that's permanently frozen. Well, what we're seeing over time is that this uh, active layer is getting deeper and deeper. So meaning that it's thawing out further and further. Well, now if you start thawing this out further and further, you also run the risk of it drying out as well, making it more vulnerable to catch fire. And if it catches fire, then the heat reaches further down into the ground. So eventually it starts really working its way down that more and more of the permafrost starts thawing. And when it starts thawing and you got the burning, you have more methane, nitrous oxide, CO2, et cetera, uh, being put into the atmosphere. But heat wave just really brings everything up to a level where it can uh, burn. So a key concern of Arctic science is that some of these fires are burning not just across the surface, but down into the soil, just as I described, right? through the layers of all the organic material. But how big they are and how hot they are, I would say there's no way they're not burning down, says Amber Soya, 
who is an associate research fellow at the National Institute of Aerospace and an expert in Siberian wildfires. As the fires eat their way underground, climate warming greenhouse gases are released into the atmosphere, right? Heard me describe this. And triggering more Arctic warming, more permafrost thaw. That's, here's that little feedback loop, which ain't so little. <clears throat> More immediately, ground fires give off heat, which can drive additional thawing and burning of the permafrost. Again, I just describe all this mechanism. So while it's unclear how much carbon is being released by this year's fires or how much permafrost is thawing because of them, scientists are, are want to investigate these questions, do the research to get those answers. Longer term, the fires might also degrade the permafrost by removing upper layers of soil that act as an insulating barrier, a process that has been well documented in boreal forests. Permafrost deterioration can cause the ground to collapse, what's called slumping. And then sometimes the slumping can lead to what's called liquefaction, especially if you have thaw, unstable permafrost. Some time ago, I did a video segment uh, basically defining uh, what permafrost is, the different types of permafrost, etc. And so when the ground collapses on itself, melted ice can pool up on the surface in lakes, something scientists witnessed in the wake of a large tundra fire on Alaska's North Slope in 2007. You know, how these fires have altered the Arctic delicate ecological balance is another important question that must be uh, investigated research. Soya says that severely scorched boreal forests sometimes transform into pyrogenic tundra after a fire kills off the trees and burns up the seeds stored in the soil, allowing grasses to take over. Fires on land that was already tundra Meanwhile, can sometimes make it easier for shrubs to take root, darkening the landscape, which absorbs more heat, makes it more prone to uh, more fire prone in the future. And as climate change keeps moving, you know, with, with the warming planet, there is a migration north of the flora and the fauna that goes with it. So the, the flora is moving north because if you are deepening the thaw layer, the deepening layer allows the roots, the plants that require deeper roots, to take hold. Tundra vegetation versus, say, willow uh, brushes. Okay. Willow brush can requires a deeper root. Well, that deeper root, you know, is being made available. You know, the deeper soil is being made available for these guys. And so the tree line is moving north, and the potential of adding more fire fuel to the landscape. In terms of ecology, I don't know what's going to happen. This is pretty far north. I think the damage is extensive and it'll take a long time to recover. Maybe not at all. When you're talking about very slow growth rates in the Arctic, that is a real concern. <clears throat> so we, we're seeing more and more and more every day, we're seeing such uh, reports of just how drastically the landscape is changing and how we are basically, you know, through our activity uh, causing the causative agent in a lot of what we see going on. So uh, th this, this, is a, this, is, this is very serious. You know, the extent of how much heat is, you know, of the land area is being affected, how much fire is there, all this methane, nitrous oxide, CO2, all this, all the greenhouse gases being added into the atmosphere, the damage to the ecosystem, the uh, the changing of the, so the soil, the ground itself, this has major, major implications for the coming decades and centuries, plain and simple. So I um, wanted to share this with you. And uh, something we all need to keep track of along among other uh, situations. Thank you for your time. Hey friends, this is Jim reminding you to subscribe and share my videos. Also, don't forget to click the bell so that you know when I drop a video in. And I'm also asking to, for you to please support the work that I do by becoming a patron at patreon.com. 
Details in the description box below. Thank you for your continued support.